Okay. All right. There we go. Okay. Uh, well, happy Friday, everyone. It is looking like it might almost be spring out there, which is extremely exciting. And I assume means I will start seeing less and less of y'all. Um, I know we have late afternoon Friday lectures, so props to you for being here. Um, we're going to do a few sort of like dust off the cobwebs warm ups to get started. Uh, so as you kind of wander in, start talking about this, remind each other what the definition of big O, upper bound, big omega, lower bound, big theta, perfect fit, and uh, figure out which of the following is in the set of O of n squared, omega of n squared, and theta of n squared. Go ahead, discuss for let's say two minutes. Go. I'm going to fix the pull everywhere. Sorry, real quick. I'm going to, whoop, sorry, I'll do it one more time. There we go. Let's, uh, let's sort of remind ourselves of these delightful terms. I'm sure you all went to section yesterday because if you haven't figured it out, section is the key to success in this class. What has happened here? Let's try that again. Sending all the good vibes. Oh my gosh. Oh, maybe this one? All right, it's close. Once upon a time, I was a very annoying PM intern at Microsoft. And every time we walked into a conference room, I would watch the entire conference room of people try to project from PowerPoint to the shared conference room screen in that conference room. And they would have similar problems to what's happening to me right now. You can't see it, but my screen is currently flashing for reasons I don't fully understand. And at one point in my internship, I decided that I had to know how expensive it was. And I did a brief analysis on how much time it took us to get the slides presented and then a quick little estimation sum of like, okay, well, if that took 15 minutes of my time as an intern at whatever it was, $30 an hour, plus 15 minutes of my CVP's time at roughly an annual take home of 1.2 million, I found that just in the time that I sat and watched everybody struggle to project over my internship, we wasted something like $5 million. <laughs> And now here I am vamping, wasting your time as I try to get the slides to present. Okay, we're going to unplug and plug it back in again because when in doubt, am I right? Please, Google, just let me use my pen in slides and I will never have to do this again. Good vibes. Yes. Oh. Okay. All right. Promising, promising. Okay, okay. There are things on the screen now. Okay, that's our questions. Oh. OK. 
Can we do this? Will it let me do this? Can I do this from here? Hmm, maybe not. Oop. Oh my gosh, okay. I've discovered a whole new feature of PowerPoint. We're gonna give this a try until it, uh. <sighs> no, it's not even, cause it's already clicked through everything. Okay, sorry, one more time. Try it again. <sighs> um, discard. Oh my gosh. Okay, let's try this again. I believe. I believe. Okay. I don't know. Nobody breathe wrong. All right. Let's talk about these finally. Okay. So f of n equals 42. What is the theta, big theta, of this f of n for part a? What is the big theta of f of n equals 42? Yeah. Constant. Constant. Absolutely. Is there any factor of n in the number 42? No. So it's a constant time theta. So is it in the set of big O of n squared? Is this constant function upper bounded by n squared? Yes. I agree. OK, apparently there's not uh, sequential animation, so we're going to roll with it. Uh, then as you can see, that's sort of the question we're asking ourselves, right? So now this one, so this is constant. So if that's constant, what's this, this equation? Linear, I agree. And so linear is upper bounded by n squared. And then we ask ourselves, is it lower bounded by n squared? No, I agree. Is it a perfect fit for n squared? I agree. So then n log 3n, is that upper bounded by n squared? Yes, as you can see here. Is it lower bounded by n squared? No, also not a fit. And then is, so, okay, so this is n log n. That's its class there. What's the class here for this one? Quadratic. We pick out the dominating term of n. Quadratic. So, that is in the set of things that is upper bounded by big O. Is it also in the set of things that is lower bounded by n squared? Yes. Is, does that mean that it's theta is that n squared? Yes. Agreed. Let's see what these animations do. Oh, sure, animations. Why not? That doesn't make any sense. PowerPoint, you keep me on my toes every day. Um, so yes, in this case, um, and then here, 2 to the n, that is more of that polynomial time. I can spell, maybe. Um, polynomial time. So that is going to grow faster than n squared. So it is not upper bounded by n squared. It's actually lower bounded by n squared. And then maybe one more click. Aha, and there's our fit. Any questions on the definitions of O, omega, theta, or how we got to any of these answers? Yes. Why is it, why is it this one? So it's this one because we count these bounds not only upper bounded, but also if equal. So that little equal sign in there. So because this is in the quadratic complexity class, we could say it is both upper bounded and lower bounded by the complexity class as well, which then means it's theta is the quadratic. So the reason that it is lower bounded and upper bounded essentially by itself is because that's part of our definition, that little bit of equality there. Yeah, good question. Okay. So this is big O, big omega, big theta. These are ways to do the asymptotic analysis of our code models. So all of these f of n's, those are mathematical code models representing the runtime of some actual code. This is step two in our little journey through code analysis. Step one was writing a code model. Um, I actually, so this is actually a question that I wrote for a midterm 
way back when, and I think it's actually pretty compelling. Um, so I'm going to let y'all look at this. Uh, I don't think we have time to talk through it in lecture today, but I challenge you to look through this. I don't think I even put the answers on this slide. And then on Ed later, I'll post the answers to this. But the reason that this one is so interesting and the point of this, right? So this is code. We need to make the like code model. And then from the code model, then we can do the asim. I can spell totic analysis which is the big O. So we got to start with that code model first. And you'll notice what's interesting here is we have an array list as an input, and then we start to put things into a linked list, and then we make another linked list. This is one of my favorite little tricky things when I'm doing exams to try and make you think through the different data structures is I give you stuff in one data structure, then you got to use a different one to store it and move through it. So in order to get the code model of this, you're going to have to pay close attention to how each of these data structures, what their runtime is, pardon me, um, and pay attention to how many things are getting moved over. So this is my challenge warm up for all of you. Um, and then we'll discuss it on Ed a little later. Um, this is just some clarifications on when uh, we say big O. Remember how I was like, you could technically say that everything's bounded by n factorial. That's technically true. A lot of times when you are interacting with somebody from industry and they ask you for the big O of something, what they are actually asking you for is the simplified tight big O, which then means... Uh, you have the slowest growing function among the upper bounds. So if I have a linear function, here's maybe a quadratic function, here's maybe like a um, other polynomial function, these are also like all in the big O, right? But I'm really asking for like, what's the fit as close to this, but still is the upper bound, that's the tight. And you can kind of think of it as tight as like it is like sitting tighter to the actual growth rate. So that's what that word means there. And by simplified, we mean drop out all the constants. So drop out all the coefficients, drop out all the constants, drop out all the lower order um, factors of n. And that's how like the simplified tight of this would be O of n kind of thing. The simplified but not tight big O could also be O of like n squared. That's simplified but not tight. So tight means as close as possible, but still an upper bound in this case. Um, tight big omega means also like the biggest possible but the lower bound, so it's tight from the other side of things. So for example, like log n, that would be in the omega here, but it's not tight. So the linear would be the tight. Yeah, question? Yeah, I have a question about the implementation. Sure. Especially for like a polynomial class. Mm -hmm. Mm. Ah, good question. And I think uh, I'm going to add on to your question too. In this context, um, we drop away coefficients and we drop away constant factors, i.e. like things that don't have any factor of n, but we do need to preserve the exponents because say, for example, n to the 3 is different from n squared, is different from n to the 4. And then to answer your question, we also do keep those bases of the polynomial. So 2 to the n, different from 3 to the n, different from 4 to the n. Good clarification. Yeah. Um, cool. OK, that was just some, some warm up, some reminders. Uh, announcements, your first exercise was released today. So reminder, this is an individual assignment. It is due via Gradescope. Uh, you are more than welcome to create a file digitally, to print out something, to take a picture of your drawings, but it is something that is essentially like a handwritten kind of assignment. Uh, it will be due a week from today. Uh, also, <clears throat> reminder that your project one is currently out. I have a couple slides in here um, to talk about it, and uh, that will be due next Wednesday. Does anybody have any administrative questions or any questions about homework or any of that stuff before we dive into topics? Cool. 
Okay, uh, these slides, I'm not gonna go over in too much detail, but I want you to see that they're here, they're resources for you. So it's just explaining what P1 is. So P1 is giving you an ADT and asking you to implement it, right? Remember ADT, theoretical, conceptual, the interactions your customer might be expecting, data structure, the actual code implementation of how you go about accomplishing it. Um, and so there's array deck and linked deck as the two data structure implementations of the deck ADT. Um, yes. Uh, the thing that's probably weirdest about this is this is going to be using that linked structure and you are probably very familiar with writing linked list code that looks a lot like this, where you're doing that sort of like, yo, check that the front is not null, um, because you can't just start interacting with things. You're constantly trying to protect yourself against the dreaded null pointer exception. This is a way that in industry, linked lists are commonly implemented, where we have these things called sentinel nodes that are essentially just extra nodes at the front and the back of your list to help protect you from null pointers. You can kind of think of them as like the bumpers on the lanes in your bowling alley. You know what I mean? That's kind of what's going on there. Um, I just want to highlight that these are in here. I will also say my best piece of advice for all linked node structures of any kind is never never dismiss the power of drawing pictures. I still do technical interviews where I draw out my linked list in the interview and then change my arrows and number the order in which I change my arrows. Yes, it works. It works. That's my advice. Um, yeah, there you go. And you can, this is a little bit more about testing, things like that. Um, but I'll let you guys read this. Uh, anybody have any quick questions about P1? It's mostly just a resource for you. Please continue to use Ed. Thank you. You all have been using Ed wonderfully. Um, whenever, you know, if you want to post your code, you are more than welcome to post your code to Ed. Just please make that a private post. All the TAs will see it. Nobody else will see your code. But when you can, try to post general questions. It's super helpful for everybody. And, of course, feel free to answer one another's questions. It's called a discussion board. Um, oh, okay. Also, here's some stuff about working with a partner. Um, I recognize that for some of you, this might be the first time you've ever worked in groups on code. If you've come from the 142, 143 series, uh, yes, all of these assignments were technically written originally to be solo assignments, but then I decided that's not as much fun and also harder and also will take you longer. And also in actuality, working in groups on code is the most important thing you can put on your resume if you're trying to actually go into the tech industry afterwards. So there is a method to the madness, but I understand that it will introduce some complexity. That's why we give you those Git labs because we're also hoping maybe you can start to explore using the Git labs. There's a ton of materials online about how to properly work and get repos with people. Um, I'm just going to say this out loud. Don't knock pair programming, y'all. It'll feel weird the first time you do it. Pair programming is that idea that you are synchronously two brains, two bodies working on the same problem and the same code. And there's a bunch of these different structures for how to do it. Um, I will try to post some helpful and maybe hilarious videos in this. Usually there's an idea of what we would call a navigator and then a driver. I do think of this like when you're driving a car, like theoretically when I'm driving the car, I want my partner in the passenger seat to be looking at the Google Maps and telling me where to go because we are sharing the burden. And then hopefully we swap positions because I will get tired and he will get tired, so on and so forth. Uh, that's the common approach to pair programming where one person is the typist and they're just doing that mechanical work of typing away and the other person whose hands are not on the computer, they are the navigator, they are dictating what is to be written and in that sort of communication you work together and then you should swap probably at least once every hour. 
Uh, there's a lot of studies done that it improves your code quality because it's like having a code review live as you're writing code. It improves everybody's ramp up time. There are companies that do entirely pair programming um, and they are consistently coming back with some of the highest levels of uh, worker satisfaction. But I say all this to you and you were all probably like, Casey, we would never. We just split up the different methods and then we never see each other. And then when Casey's like, you need to know everything that happens in your code, we'll just read it the day before the exam. I too was a student once and I too would hear helpful things adults would say to me. And I too was like, ha ha ha, I am in crisis. I don't have time for that nonsense, but I will continually suggest these things. So I do think it actually really helps if you have the time to try it out. Um, okay, cool. Uh, we have uh, one more tool that we need to add to our code analysis toolbox today. And then on Monday, we're going to do an end-to-end um, -end analysis of some pretty complicated code. And then we're going to start adding into your data structures. So this is essentially the second to last lecture in how to analyze code. And then for the rest of the quarter, I'm just going to be giving you new data structures, new ADTs, new algorithms, and we're just going to start to use these tools. So I promise we're almost to the end of the pure mathy portions. I specifically changed this slide so it wouldn't look gross. Okay, hang on. Let's see if PowerPoint will let me. What on earth? What in the, I, I, am, I am amazed. I am amazed. Here, I'm going to show you what it looked like because I do want you to look at this code. Oh, where are you, slide? There, this is what this slide looks like. We're just going to look at it here for a hot second. <laughs> um, okay, so we, we picked up very quickly with this at the very end of lecture on Wednesday. This is how I introduced omega and theta. Um, so I sort of mentioned there's this is prime function and the way that you determine if something's a prime number is you start with the number two and then you go from two up until the number and technically if you're like Casey, I'm a math person, you only have to go up to the square root of that number, you are correct. Um, but if you can tell what I'm literally just doing is going from two up until the number and checking, hey, does this number fit perfectly into that number? If it doesn't, if it does uh, fit in there, and also this code is just wrong. I shouldn't return true in that case, should I? I should return false. Maybe the PowerPoint was trying to protect us. <laughs> Maybe that's what was happening here. Um, it's just the true and the false are inverted here. Uh, so what you can see there is essentially what we're just trying to do is we're trying to find when something divides in evenly at the moment that something divides in evenly to a number, that's actually the moment that I, I can stop looking. I know right away that that is not a prime number and I should return false instead of true. Um, otherwise, I check the next number and I keep going. And so this is a situation where in order to determine, for example, that say here, five is a prime number, I check two two, three, four, five, um, and then I like was able to report that five is a prime number. Then I came down here and I see the number six. Six is really close down here to the bottom, meaning it was very fast to determine that six is not a prime number. Because right away I did, hey, is six mod, or is like six mod two, is that gonna be zero? Yeah, it is, that's a perfect divisor. And so right away, because six is an even number, I could report out that that's not a prime number. And then I kind of have this pinball back and forth. And each one of these dots here, that's when I had to loop all the way through numbers to determine that something is prime. I can only determine something's prime by sort of like process of elimination, which is very expensive. And so that's how we get this like really wonky type of runtime graph. So that's what led us to this, like, we'll see sometimes big O isn't enough. Sometimes we need to know, hey, what is the upper bound and also what's the lower bound? So that's how we got our big O of linear and our big omega of constant. Because it's for those even numbers, I didn't even have to do any looping, right? As soon as I saw that value of two, I could bail out. 
And then theta is that perfect fit. So I think I, this is the slide that I briefly showed you at the end of lecture. Um, so you can see here, and this is kind of what we did for warm up, right? Um, 4n squared as a code model, that is lower bounded by constant functions. 4n squared is still lower bounded by linear complexity class. 4n squared is lower bounded by n squared. It is in itself, there you go, in the omega of n squared. But it is not lower bounded by cubed or lower bounded by n to the 4. Versus on this side, I can see that it is not upper bounded by constant, nor is it upper bounded by linear. It is upper bounded by n squared, but then it is upper bounded by cubed and fourth. And so that overlap there, that's how we get that theta. So for your homework assignment, do I have any slides in this? No, apparently I don't. Okay. Um, my question to you all is, okay, first we'll start with, wait, am I in the, sorry, I just realized that I was still in um, Google Slides. There we go. Okay, so looking at these two here, here we've got a function f of n equals n. We have the big O is n, the big omega is n. What is the theta? I agree. Over here, we've got the big O is n, the big omega is 1. What's the theta? Does anybody know? Yeah. The theta does not exist. I hear that in Lindsay Lohan's voice from Mean Girls when she's at the math competition, and she's like, the limit does not exist. You know what I'm talking about? The theta does not exist, y'all. If the simplified tight O and the simplified tight omega do not match, then the theta does not exist. Yeah? Because there isn't a fit. I just wanted to make sure I said that because you need that for your exercises. Any questions about that? I will fully admit some mathematician decided that we can just decide this doesn't exist. It's like, you know, you can't divide by zero. It's undefined. I think it's just one of those situations. It's like this, this doesn't make sense in this context. But just so you know, if the simplified type big O and the simplified type big omega don't match, theta doesn't exist. Cool? Okay. Okay. I think that's pretty much all we needed to talk to um, about the big O, big omega, and big theta lands. Now let's return to the sort of concept of how we're going through code analysis in general. So we have been right now talking all about asymptotic analysis, which is really step two. Step one is to get that code model, to get that function out, right? So once we have the runtime function, it's like we kind of have this tool asymptotic analysis that sort of like clips onto it. And now that we've explored asymptotic analysis beyond big O, we actually sort of have like three different ways to sort of analyze code within the context, context of asymptotic analysis. And in this situation, f of n of 10n squared plus 13n plus 2 to get its simplified tight big O and big omega, I'm going to ignore the lower order terms because they don't matter at scale as n approaches infinity. I'm going to get rid of the coefficients, because that also doesn't matter as I approach infinity. And all I really care about is this dominating term here. And that dominating term then gives us the big O, it gives us the big omega, and since those two things match, huzzah, I have a big theta. Sounds good. If I instead look at this is prime example, right, Again, we sort of have that big O of n, n, but the big theta does not exist. So here's our overall roadmap so far. We started with code. We've got a code model. Now we've got some big O. We just finished building this tool. I'm going to add one more sort of way to think about code into your toolbox. We're going to kind of return back a step and realize that actually there might be a few different possible code models 
for a particular piece of code. Welcome to case analysis. So let's start with an example. I think it helps a lot. So here is some code for linear search. And so in linear search, we have some amount of things stored in an array of ints. And the then r.length, that equals n in this case. That's the number of things we're applying this code to. And then we have some other value, something to find. And I literally just want to search through this linear set of things and determine if the thing to find is in it. So let's say I want to find the value two in this example array. If we look at our code, we're gonna see we start i at zero, we go into the length of the array, we count up by one, and we check if the thing at i is the thing I'm looking for. If so, return. And remember, return just ends a method, right? That's like that ejection, that escape hatch. We just immediately end, we bail out of the loop. Otherwise, we will keep looping and looping and looping, and then it's not until we get to the end of the loop that we will return negative one. And the reason we can do that, right, is we know that if the code ever even manages to can accomplish the for loop all the way through, that means I didn't find the thing. So at that point, after the for loop, I'm just gonna automatically return one, indicating I looked all the way through, and since I was able to finish the loop, that means I never found anything. So I'm just gonna bail at that point. So in this context where I'm finding two, I'm gonna dive in, I'm gonna look, hey, I starts at zero, is the thing at zero, the thing I'm looking for? In this case, huzzah, yes it is, I'm done. At this point, my loop ran exactly one time, right? Now let's say I'm trying to find the value eight. So I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna look at the index zero, I'm gonna say, hey, is this eight? It is not, so I must continue to loop. Is this eight? It is not, is this eight, is this eight, is this eight? So you can see there, I have a lot more iterations of my loop. In fact, the number of iterations of my loop were exactly the same number of items that were in my original set, because I have to look at everything, right? What's interesting about this situation here is I've got the exact same set of data. I've got the same number of items in there. They're in the exact same order, same values, but I changed one thing about the sort of like other variable here. And in one situation, this was a constant time evaluation, right? It found it immediately. It didn't matter if there was four numbers left to look at or if there was a million numbers left to look at. Boom, right away we found that thing we were looking for. Very convenient. But if the thing wasn't in the list, I had to go through the entire list in order to check that it wasn't in there. And that was very dependent on how many things were in the list. So we like to think of this situation as this is like our best case scenario, and this is our worst case scenario. Notice best and worst case has nothing to do with how many things are in the set or the set of data, but this other sort of factor that's come along. So yeah, you can think of this um, as lucky, <laughs> if you will. Um, I'm pretty sure Hunter Schaefer made this slide in 2020. Um, and so we can graph the functionality of the code for the best case and worst case scenarios. Because if we remember that code, like to find it, if it's at the very beginning, it's just that constant runtime. It's always just sort of like do a couple checks, do an access of an index of an array, check if it's what you're looking for, return it. So maybe that's just like a, a two instructions. If it's not that, then it's probably like we got to do some amount of work inside of a loop that runs n times and then afterwards we return after the loop. And so we end up with two entirely different code models, two entirely different functions of the runtime based on whether we are in the lucky case or the unlucky case. 
And sometimes this has a huge impact on when you're deciding the design of your code. Maybe you have a situation where you're very likely to get lucky a lot. Depends, right? Like maybe you have a collection of items that the things at the beginning are the more regularly used items, so you're more likely to find them there, and you've sort of been using the less frequently accessed items at the end, so you're more likely to find the thing you're looking for really quickly. Maybe it's like a priority queue situation, you got things all nice and sorted for yourself. Or maybe the worst case scenario is incredibly common, you need to be aware of that so you don't get stuck in the best case scenario. So, since we have two different code models for the different cases, we can then apply asymptotic analysis to each of the different cases. So the asymptotic analysis of the best case scenario is just constant time, baby. And then the asymptotic analysis of the worst case, linear. So case analysis is another way want to go from code to function, adding in a little bit more nuance into our analysis of our code. So a case is a description of the input slash state of the data set that is specific enough to build a code model around. Um, ba -da -ba, let's see, our case analysis is a tool for reasoning about all variations other than n. So for example, you will be tempted to say, well, the best case scenario, Casey, is when I only have one item in the list. Then I will always know right away if the things in the list are not. That is unfortunately not how we can do case analysis. Because remember, these functions are an operation of the runtime as n tends toward infinity. So the cases cannot vary based on the n, but they can vary based on other things that might happen to n. Like in that scenario, the thing I was looking for, that varied. My n was the same set of five numbers in the same order, but I got two very different behaviors. Also, for example, like if we're thinking about that is prime, you might be thinking like, oh, well maybe that like linear was the worst case and that constant was the best case. No, because those, um, O's and omegas was based on which value of n it was. And this case analysis can't be dependent on changes in n. It is a way for you to incorporate other influencing factors into your code analysis. Yes. So a lot of times this is probably what your case analysis may look like. Um, that as things get bigger and bigger, you might have like differences of a con, you know, coefficient kind of thing. So maybe like the worst case scenario is like 10 N and the best case scenario is just N something like that. Um, this is really common. And so you might actually have a lot of conversations in industry that kind of look like this, where we kind of want to know what is that range, like between the best and worst case scenario. And then usually people are going to ask, like, how common is the best case? How common is the worst case? And if you go on and you take, uh, like, the CSE majors version of this case, they are going to talk about something called amortized cases, where they sort of try to figure out how to, like, mathematically combine all of these into a general case. I'm going to be real with you. I haven't heard anybody in industry ever say amortized cases to me. Um, also, I will fully own that if you go talk to other computer scientists about this best and worst case scenario, they will be very familiar with those terms and they will use them the way that I have used them, but they probably were not explicitly ever defined for them. This is literally like Casey coming from industry back to academia to be like, we should actually define this stuff because I'm really tired of having arguments with baby boomers in design conversations where they are like, I can't define best case and worst case, but I know it in my gut. You come prepared. <laughs> you shall be right in your arguments. Um, okay, caution. I do introduce this because I think it does give you another level of subtlety, another level of nuance in analyzing your code, but it is so easy to just think worst case, upper bound. Best case, lower bound. Those are different things. 
The cases are when you have two different code functions coming out of the same bit of code. Any code model can have its own big O, omega, and theta. And I think, yes, yes. Um, here, you can read through this too. Um, this, you can see, is like we have big O, big omega, and big theta for each the worst case and the best case. So the worst case of the big, the big O of the worst case scenario is just like no matter what, what is the absolute slowest that this code is going to run? That's really what they're asking for here. And when you're in an interview scenario, this box here is probably what they are asking of you. Now, annoyingly, we're going to get into some data structures where I'm going to show you that there are some really bad worst cases out there, but they're so rare that actually you will find you are generally expecting the best case scenario instead, and I promise I will call them out for you. But this is also, like I said, me just trying to like clarify these terms once you leave school so that we can all have this shared language. So most often, if you're in an interview and people are asking you, okay, analyze your code, they're asking for the worst case upper bound. But you can technically do big omega of the worst case, too, and big omega of the best case. Um, I am going to continue to ask you to analyze your code from a best case and worst case scenario. Like I said, there are m other amortized, more mathematical ways of doing this. But I think at least when you're thinking about your code, if you can always stop and ask yourself, what is the absolute worst thing that can happen? What is the absolute best thing that can happen? You kind of understand those extremes. You're going to have a better general understanding of the entire sort of like lifetime of your code. So that's why I find them especially useful. We're going to continue to do best case, worst case analysis throughout the rest of the quarter. But here are some other cases that do come up that uh, can be helpful. Uh, I kind of like to think of these situations as, you know, in physics, how when you're learning about relativity, you're all living in that like frictionless space. Yeah. A lot of times computer science will do that, right? And like they do that frictionless space because they're like, we don't want to worry about that for right now. We just want to talk about this theoretical piece. That comes up in computer science too. People will say things like, okay, what is the runtime of this? But assume that won't happen. And more often than not, they're like, let's just assume, like, I want to know the runtime, but like without the resizes. So assume the resizing doesn't happen. You might be like, hey, but the resizing's got to happen. It's just because that's such a, like, we know whenever you have to resize an array, we're just going to incur a factor of n. Usually people are sort of asking about this case because they, they just, they already can understand that piece of it. They just want to do analysis without that sort of complicating things. Uh, average case, that's sort of like the amortized. Um, I haven't heard amortized in industry, but I have heard people say average case. And um, I don't think they have this definition really, but what this really is supposed to mean technically is assume your input is totally random. So for example, in like a collection of numbers, assume that it's a random set of numbers, i.e. don't assume all the numbers are the same or assume a random distribution of numbers within there. Don't assume all of the numbers are sorted or reverse sorted or in any type of linear, like you just have to assume pure randomness of your input set. You probably already are kind of thinking that way, right? Like we're not really like thinking about how our input is structured, but as we think about our like collections of data, you'll find it's actually very rare for data to just be totally random, right? Like think about a data set that's just a bunch of new users. New users aren't just gonna like pop in evenly, randomly distributed from all over the world at all different moments in time. You're probably gonna get these like fits and bursts of new user signups that may or may not be somewhat related to each other. And you're going to see all those sorts of like trends reflected in your data. This idea of average case is, again, taking it back to that like frictionless ideal. It's like, okay, well, how does this code behave if none of the sort of external influencing factors of life are dictating how this data set is getting built up? In practice case, I just made this up, <laughs> is what I think is a better way 
to express what people in industry are often trying to say when they say average case. In practice case means, what do you think is actually going to happen knowing how the data really behaves? So yeah, like I said, like let's say our data set is, um, maybe our data set is a bunch of purchase purchases against our supply, right? Maybe it's Amazon Prime purchases. Well, we know that that's not random. So the average case doesn't make sense there, right? There's probably an explosion of purchases on Prime Day. There's probably an explosion of purchases around Christmas. There's probably like like-minded purchases during different times of the day. Like I'm guessing at 2 a.m. people are probably buying, I don't know, uh, things that are trying to bring joy into your sad life. Why are you awake at 2 a.m.? Very different from when Casey has to emergency order a stupid dongle at 9 a.m. and have it prime delivered in two hours, right? Like there's probably some kind of patterns that show up. The more you can really think about those patterns of your code and analyze your code and its performance from that perspective and design for those perspectives, the more efficient your code's gonna be. I call that the impractice case. Now I will pause here. Let's see, let's do a story time. Um, once upon a time, I worked at a startup called Carrot, just for funsies. Anybody here taken a Carrot interview as part of your interview? Uh, like anybody interviewed at Indeed, for example, or Intuit recently? Nobody? That actually brings me a little bit of joy. Don't tell my former CAO. Um, so I used to work at a startup called Carrot, and I was the director of interviewing, so I wrote interview questions all day, and we did a bunch of AI analysis on who was coming into the interviews, who was getting the interviews, who was coming out of the interviews. And at the exact same moment that I was doing that analysis, Amazon released a really embarrassing report, and I still don't know why they decided to release it publicly, because honestly, not a good look. And their report was that they had done a bunch of analysis on applications to work at Amazon. And then they had done the same analysis that I had done around like, oh, how, ma how many of those people get interviews? How many of those people get offers? And they found that if your name was Josh and you played polo in high school, you are very likely to get a job at Amazon. <laughs> this is real, y'all. I will post it on the ed board later. Now, their machine learning algorithms are trying to process so much data that you can imagine they might try to optimize their algorithms. And if they optimize their algorithms, they might send emails to anyone named Josh or with the word polo on their resume a little faster than other things. This is an example of in-practice data introducing unethical bias into the algorithms. Now, I don't think anybody did this by accident, or did this by design, sorry, I think they did it by accident, but it is another example of why I do think it's incredibly important for us to always be thinking about our data sets. And this in-practice analysis actually becomes vital to ensuring that we are designing code that is properly functioning. If we are only ever thinking about code in the frictionless space, in the absence of reality, we're not designing for the real world. So in case analysis, always think, what's the best case? What's the worst case? And what is my actual data set going to look like? And how do I analyze from there? I think the rest of these slides you can see now, this is our full pipeline of analysis where we've sort of slotted in case analysis from the code, and then you can attach asymptotic analysis to any of the individual cases. We are going to pick back up with this, and we're going to analyze some really gnarly code come Monday. So maybe give that practice problem I put in the slides a chance, and we'll talk about it on Ed Together, y'all. Thanks so much for being here. Have a fabulous weekend, and I will see you on Monday. Mm. Yeah.